Hi and welcome to this uh, artist talk with uh, artist Signe Johannesen. My name is Tobias Kjellner and I work as a curator at Accelerator. Today I'm joined by my colleague Ronin Bailey Sharfrit, project leader of Accelerator's art and research program. And of course also by artist Signe Johannesen that right now actually is sitting down in uh, Accelerator's exhibition space in front of uh, one of her new works that she will be showing in our upcoming exhibition. Uh, a big warm welcome to you, Signe. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this, this artist talk is organized as part of the upcoming group exhibition, The, the Experimental Field, um, that Signe is taking part in. The exhibition uh, has been installed uh, a few months ago and today when we record this we don't know exactly when we will open due to the pandemic situation but uh, we are ready and we very much look forward to welcome you all uh, to Accelerator soon and this exhibition um, very soon hopefully. <clears throat> this talk will be uh, 70 minutes long and for you who follows this uh, presentation live on Facebook, there will be a few minutes in the end where you have the chance uh, um, to ask some short questions. Uh, and you do this uh, through the comment section on the live stream on Facebook. And it would be great if these uh, questions then could be in English, that helps us. Um, the, the artist talk will focus on the two work uh, two works that Signe will be showing at Accelerator and uh, uh, it will also bring up previous works and some central interests uh, for that it's central in Signe's practice. Uh, we will also touch upon a few um, upon the new collaborative, collaborative dialogues and experiments that Signe is engaged in right now as part of her work for this show. Um, the exhibition, The Experimental Field, is curated by me and Accelerator's artistic director, Richard Yuli. And the exhibition presents eight contemporary artists or artist group and also has a, a, a historical section with historical works. Uh, the exhibition takes its starting point from the history of the place, the sites that we are at, so the Stockholm University campus, because this site used to be um, from the year 1816 and about 150 years onwards it was called the experimental field and it was a site for um, experiments with crops and livestock for the purpose of agricultural development in Sweden uh, and this exhibition brings up relationships between different species as a central theme particularly between us humans and the more than humans and this is also something that Signe uh, very much has worked with throughout her practice. A majority of the works in the exhibition have performative qualities and things that are brought up is um, questions concerning structures for knowledge production and uh, in science um, and experiments around ways of living and of learning and these are also aspects that Signe will touch upon today. Uh, I think I will go, uh, give the word to my colleague Bronwyn to introduce Signe briefly. Yeah, I just wanted to say on top of that, I'm so happy to be here. Um, and thank you for everyone joining us today. So Signe Johannesson uh, studied at Oslo National College of the Arts in Norway, and then at the Royal Institute of Art Stockholm, Sweden. She makes sculptures, videos, drawings, and installations, and her artistic processes often evolve through workshops and excursions uh, in collaboration with various experts. Johannesson is one of the founders of Art Lab Genesta, a self-organized experimental practice uh, and institute in Sormland. And I also wanted to just highlight here how um, intertwined Signa's practice is with art and research. Um, 
I was really very happy to invite Signe to come and speak with the interdisciplinary researcher group here in January 2020 um, at Accelerator that were actually a group of um, scientists, lawyers, geologists, biologists, and other researchers who were responding to Tina Segal's work. Um, and they, and along with myself, were very fascinated with Signe's really unique approach to kind of interdisciplinary uh, research. Uh, and transdisciplinary research in an art making context. Um, and so that's how we began our collaboration and then happily uh, it has expanded into this exhibition as well. So I'll pass back to Therese now. Okay, so I think I'll start with the first uh, question to you Signe and I think it will be a long one because we have so much to touch upon. Uh, so we've been working together for a bit more than a year now and it has been a very uh, eventful process with a lot of uh, unexpected but exciting turns throughout the time and it has resulted in a completely new work for the exhibition or um, that is called posthumous dialogue that the one that you're sitting in front of and that you're also showing right now and uh, um, when we started our collaboration you were mostly or you were very interested in um, the role of the cow at the site of uh, the experimental field and also the history of the human cow relationship more at large. It was an idea that I know you, that you had developed out of an encounter of a, a specific archive, namely the archive at the Swedish University of Agricultural Science and how this archive was uh, structured, you have often turned to archives, I know, uh, both for research and for making work. So I thought you could maybe uh, talk a little bit about the process behind this work, but also about how um, the role of archives in your practice. Yeah, um, it's, I think I've been interested in uh, the way that we store things and the way that we write history throughout my, my artistic career. Uh, but this specific um, uh, interest of like the human cow relationship is something that I, um, I've been kind of struggling with, uh, you know, the like non-language that we have. Uh, there's like a gap, a language gap. We don't really know. I don't feel that we have a way to talk about the relationship uh, that we have had with, for example, the cow throughout our uh, evolutionary history and, and that took us here and, and also other domesticized animals such as the horse, for example, which is one of the, uh, the um, non-humans that I've been working a lot with and, and uh, trying to um, get as close as I can to. So the whole uh, idea with the experimental field when you and me started talking to this was, was actually then I was uh, really interested in, for example, how the cow has been this, uh, for example, the vaca was what created the vaccine. The first time that we actually discovered the vaccine, which is like one of our biggest breakthroughs in medicine history is actually from the teeth of a cow. And I, I kind of, uh, just, you know, uh, started thinking about how this, these enormous breakthroughs are actually um, embedded in a relationship that is so invisible. So that's how we started out. And, and when I have been working at SLU, I went there because I was curious about like, how do we, how do we archive this kind of uh, relationship? And, and then I was uh, let into this uh, corridor with rooms and rooms of um, that was just filled with the remains of, of these animals. And, and I was both a bit shocked and maybe a bit like shook, like really like, um, um, it was like an uncomfortable feeling when I, when I recognized how these, these uh, beings were kind of categorized, like this is the pelvic bones in this box and this is the, this is the collarbones. But then I was like, but how many beings are there in this archive and, and who, who were they? And some of them were very new and others were like many hundred years old. And also you must remember that SLU, the, the institution that is now SLU was a part of 
SU earlier. So this is very, very related to uh, the experimental field and the, and the accelerator location. So then my urge was to try to find a way to care for those bones. And, and so I started making casts of them. So I cast all the bones that I could get access to uh, and carefully tried to keep to, to make replicas so that I could find ways of homaging them other ways, because obviously I, um, their archive is stuck at SLU. So, uh, and this is something uh, I've done before, and we will get back to where the, this took me, but like earlier, the reason why I've been so interested in this is like we have had this urge, this is an image from, from the World Exhibition in Paris 1900, and it's just interesting how we have always uh, maybe had the trouble with caring for uh, remains of, of the ones that are not here anymore. And, and, it, and this image is interesting because during the big dinosaur rush, there was like all these male egos that was trying to find new species of dinosaurs and assemble them and claim them as a species. And, and the, it all kind of became a huge, uh, uh, a conflict between uh, uh, two archaeologists called Marsh and, and Cope. And in the end, uh, th this is the catalog of the world exhibition, but they were so in a hurry to claim this species and to kind of, uh, you know, archive it so that they had to reprint the catalog because they had put the head on the wrong side of the body. And this is this kind of behavior of, of like, um, uh, the need of claiming, oh yeah, this is true, or this is what this species is, or this is uh, like, it's, it says, it tells us something about us. And so this is something that I've been uh, exploring in various works. And actually the work that uh, uh, Bronwyn was referring to is this work, which is uh, the seal in the labyrinth and the eternal rest. And it kind of, um, it refers to that I found uh, a body of a seal in the city archive of Norrköping, and I was so struck by this body that was laying there because it was the size of my body. And I was like, but can this be? It really looks like it's a human remain assembly. And so I invited actually a SU um, archaeologist, osteoarchaeologist uh, Jan Stora to come and uh, and uh, help me to understand what, what is this? Because this, this baby seal that was laying there, I felt so much that it was a human. And so actually we were, uh, after a lot of work, we, we were allowed to open the archive and actually reassemble this body because what he said when he came there was that, oh my God, this is very wrong. Like this bone from his ass over here is actually going up in his, in his shoulder area. And how can this be? It's been laying like this for 100 years and has been a, a curriculum for all school kids in Norrköping to come and see this seal and hear the story about how it was found under the, under the when they were constructing the new city hall. And so I just, just reminded me of, of how, um, how uh, we are all the time trying and rushing to, to claim a truth of history and, or the truth of the other. And uh, I've been just uh, interested in, in looking at that in different ways. And so, but we're not going to see the whole work, but I just wanted to show. So this is what I found in the beginning. And then after, in the collaboration with, with Jan, this is actually how a seal looks like for real. So for over 100 years, this has been presented in our national archive as, as this seal body, which was completely incorrect. And I found this super interesting. So I've been like um, looking at this, uh, yeah, in different projects. This is another project where I was exhibiting at Kalmar Konstmuseum and in an ongoing collaboration with my colleagues at Cultivator, which is also actually a part of the experimental field, which is very exciting. Uh, when I was there at Erland, I actually found the remains of the last living pony of the type, the Erland horse. Uh, and this skeleton was uh, stored and archived in a cellar area in a, in a folk high school at Erland. But it looked super uncomfortable because I love horses. I could see that it was standing in a very painful position and it was actually carrying its, the whole species on its shoulder because it was the last one of its kind. 
And so what I did, did in that work was actually to invite uh, a veterinary expert of, of, uh, of uh, osteology, uh, Tove, um, uh, to come to Ireland and do a workshop together with me and together with horse enthusiasts, local horse enthusiasts, and learn as much as we could about comfortable resting positions and reassembly this, this last li uh, horse, Lily, that would carry uh, the whole species on her shoulders forever into an eternal resting position. So I've been interested in, in these kind of questions for a long time. Um, yeah, I don't know if that uh, kind of... Um, yeah, it, uh, you, you answered it, um, my questions. It's, it, it, when you explain, it's like um, you, you also explain uh, like meeting the archive and, and um, somehow trying to maybe uh, correct or heal uh, all the, um, um, the idea of the human su superiority and, and, and the, the, all the wrongdoings. Uh, um, or many wrongdoings, at, at least, that uh, um, we as a species, but also maybe science, um, is uh, claiming. Yeah, in good faith, I, I think. Like, I think that we have done so many things, and so many things we have done to each other and to others, um, uh, uh, other non-humans are, like, it's not, it's not always because we want to do wrong. Like, obviously, we think that we're doing something right, but mm. I find that there is an interesting knowledge uh, often for me when I go back and like reinterpret or like uh, maybe the glitches ha can tell us something that that the successes can't. And maybe, you know, uh, in terms of like being aware of our, um, yeah, our capacity to actually uh, both uh, like that our actions actually mean something like I think it's uh, there is something uh, really healing for me uh, uh, to go back and, and like a grieve or maybe like rework things that doesn't fit like if it doesn't sit well <laughs> maybe it's time to yeah reassembly it so that it can for example in Lily's uh, example so it can rest and it felt really well, good, you know, like we also built her a huge window so that she could like have better view. And yeah, so for me, it's, uh, um, it's a very intimate, it's an intimate practice actually, often. Mm. I think that really comes across in, in especially both of these examples. And I think I really get the sense that especially with that seal body, the closeness to to my own body and the kind of sense of rest that comes when you see mm. it, um, resting in the kind of correct position. But I think that leads us perfectly to the next kind of discussion around glitches and changes of direction and also senses of taking care um, of the archive, which I think is such a central part of your work. So tell us with um, posthumous dialogue, the work that's sitting behind you here um, at Accelerator, what kind of turn did that work take? Um, and how did your collaboration with Stockholm University Associate Professor Christina Fredengren from the Department of Archaeology and Classical Studies, how did that begin and take bloom? Yeah, so let's go back to SLU. So I was like manically casting this, this archive <laughs> that I found. I was casting and casting and casting hundreds and hundreds. I just felt the need to kind of take care of them and so I couldn't I, I couldn't and I also maybe it was too close to work with the actual remains so I, I wanted to make these replicas to put to to be able to work with them in, an, in a new way and while I was doing that uh, my kind of um, uh, this is some images from that production but my my studio filled up with with all this uh, all these replicas, just like piles and piles of them. And I was a bit, um, you know, really just in a manic state. And at that time I was, I met Christina Fredegren because she came to my studio because we have a common love for bogs and, and, and what, uh, waters. And so actually her and some of her colleagues came to have a session, like a, a discussion, a session with me. Uh, and when she came into my studio, something magical happened because it was like uh, some, uh, one of those meetings that, that, you know, you're not prepared for it. She just came in and she looked around and she started looking at 
you know, the braided of, braids of hair that was laying in a pile. And she started looking at, oh, okay, so here is a, a hoof of a horse. And okay, so there is, there is a, a part of a cow. And, and then she started uh, uh, to tell me, so this is Christina right here, um, uh, by the bog that we visited together. Uh, she started to tell me about a find, an archaeological find that she had been researching. And she also wrote a really nice paper on it on uh, in a, the Journal of Wetland Archaeology. Um, and this is the find of, um, uh, uh, it has the, the number SHM242127, so 24217, in the National Archives of the History Museum. And it's a find at a a bog called Högtorpsmossen outside of Örebro. And she just told me about this find of a female body, uh, a middle-aged female body, uh, and how one of her feet was actually a hoof of a horse, and the other uh, was a pig's foot. And on, uh, on her shoulder, there was a cow's shoulder blade, and her jaw was a dog's jaw. And we just started talking about this and what these kind of uh, multi-species uh, uh, archaeological assembly finds could, could entail and, and what, what kind of questions do they raise. Uh, and I started working with this and started to try to understand this, like what, what does it um, uh, mean? And I started to try it out, like, okay, what is it to have this shoulder of a cow? And what is it to actually have a hoof of a horse? But also one of the things that was so interesting um, that made me so intrigued was that she, she also explained how this find kind of breaks the linear time understanding because uh, the, the female parts uh, were from um, early Bronze Age and other parts were from the 1800s. And so the different animals and parts were from different times and how um, obviously how could it happen? But I kept on coming back to how I was more interested in the questions that this find raises rather about our kind of co-relationship with these animals. Because, yeah, so it was just one of those magical meetings. And I started kind of uh, getting very inspired by Freden Gren's research and also have had like an ongoing dialogue with her for, for a long time now, and it will go on. So. The posthumous dialogue work is actually the start of something because here, um, uh, like, I'm I'm starting to research these types of finds uh, in dialogue with uh, uh, Fredengren. So yeah, it's a beginning of something, and it has definitely triggered a new type of exploration for me, like where I. Uh, yeah, for example, I've never done like performances before, but now it feels like bodily encounters or like embodying has become even more uh, even more important as a method of research rather mm. than maybe output. Like it's yeah. too early to say, I would say. But yeah, I mean, so this uh, what you see here at Accelerator is actually um the first step of of uh, celebrating and cherishing what this queer uh female body uh of Högtorps mossen can uh, can in which directions mm. she can point us it's such a fascinating find and i think that two of you just have this kind of um, like, you know, like a seismic kind of connection where you can kind of feel the same um, vibration somehow, which is just beautiful. And you both come from such different disciplines, but then meeting in this really vibrant space together. Um, you kind of talked about how that it has opened or triggered this kind of performative explorations. Could you talk a little bit about your collaboration with Colberry Company um, as a type of kind of post-human performance um, kind of drawing on non-linear non ways of understanding history. Um, yeah, do you want to say a few words about that really special yeah. collaboration too? I will, but but before I do that, I just have yeah. to tell you the last missing oh, puzzle, please. which is, 
you know, it kind of has catapulted me into our, um, uh, our own like cultural, historical and religious uh, um, history, because mm. obviously one part of, of this find in Högtops Mossen was uh, 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 a rib bone that has still yet not been able to uh, identify as a species. So like suddenly this find kind of catapults me back to you know the our the myth of of um, of becoming human, and so but we will get get back to that. But I just wanted to say that, and that's also why I needed to start to explore it from a performative point of view, and at as a, a cosmic um, uh, <laughs> just like you're one of those enormous gifts that you get from above. Uh, suddenly, I was invited into this collaboration with Kulberg, as you say. And this is a project called Explorations of Now, where Kulberg and uh, my, uh, my um, colleagues at Cultivator and, and other artists as well are exploring you know, the now in different ways and what it, what it means to be in this kind of uh, time of global shifts and ecological shifts. So what we're doing together is actually just, uh, yeah, we are exploring. So they were just, they just left the room actually. So I'm working with four uh, dancers who have like um, uh, very uh, various, uh, like um, uh, uh, very interesting uh, like uh, approaches to their own bodies and to their own uh, like uh, practice. And so we're meeting and experimenting uh, in different uh, ways. Uh, and we don't really know where it will take us. But uh, for example, we've had a series of meetings where we have explored um, both the bogs that, that kind of carries these finds as a feminist place and as a very um, yeah, uh, knowledgeable place. But also we did this, uh, some experiments uh, on the roof of Accelerator in the old water tank. And here, they, some of the dancers are exploring the cracks in this water tank. And like, uh, we were thinking about where this water um, kind of entered. And on the other side of this wall, uh, interestingly enough, obviously there is uh, the Natural History Museum because when, as you can see, so we have also been like uh, thinking about this find because it's in the history museum because there's a human part in it, but uh, there's also many uh, non-human parts. So maybe we, we, yeah, we were just exploring where it actually did belong or where do it belong. And then another thing that actually also back to Christina because um, she, uh, she's been talking to me about what it means to be an archaeologist and how she view her profession. And uh, I've been so uh, like, um, I've been trying out some of her statements uh, as, uh, as in these explorations. And one of the things that she, she have uh, uh, said is that being an archaeologist uh, actually means to talk for the dead or sing for the dead. Um, and so that's a very different and very like, um, in my understanding, a very different way of talking about uh, archiving archaeology. And I find that so interesting. So some of the things that we did together, Kulberg and me, was to actually share lullabies and, uh, and try that out. What is it to have to do that, to sing for the dead? So what you're seeing now is completely unedited, um, just small, small um, uh, documentations of, of um, experiments that are ongoing. And we will see where this will take us. And this is something that you will, uh, you are working on right now, um, like an, a, a longer process that you're into with uh, Cool Bay, but also with the uh, uh, Christina, and it will go on throughout the um, the exhibition period, um, uh, and maybe probably even longer. Um, and uh, um, there will be some presentations of this uh, collaborations uh, 
uh, later on in when we have opened and yeah. later in the um, exhibition period. Yeah, I'm, I, we will see. Like now, we're in like both like bodily uh, explorations. We are filming. We are we're just playing basically. We're we're um, yeah, we're playing. We're playing uh, with this story and but taking it but in a super serious way. We're mm. trying it out, uh, like uh, you know, um, like shapeshifters trying on different <laughs> coats. And trying trying this story out in different ways, and one of the ways is is behind me here in in the exhibition hall. But other other ways are obviously like we're gonna we're working towards getting access to the archive, and uh, and addressing the actual find um, mm. uh, is one of the things that me and Fred and Glenn have talked about. So we will see like uh, later we will respond uh, to this type of find together for the public. Uh, so yeah, it's very exciting time to be in such an open process, but it's also very vulnerable. Like you, you, you're very, it's very, like it feels like you have no, no clothes on. <laughs> like it's, it's a dangerous position to, to share a process that is so open still. Mm. But yeah, so it's, it's an exercise for sure. What I've um, understood from you and Christina is that uh, these kind of finds um they're not they're not common but they uh there it exists several of them uh with these like multi-species body and that that science archaeologists have a difficulty to to, to answer or like to explain them and you you just said that um uh, you're curious about all the like all the questions or methods that it can open up and I already see so many um, at, at least experiments that it has opened up uh, for you. And you know, uh, Therese, it's, it's really true because this find is obviously in the archive, it's not on display. And I think that often this is what happens because uh, we as a species are so, we are so obsessed by, uh, you know, the, we need an explanation for everything. So we, we are really uncomfortable living with stuff that has no, uh, no correct answer, so to speak. And I'll get back to that later because it comes back to my love for the archive and what it says about us. But, you know, um, uh, so th this is a way of just like cherishing and maybe shedding light upon these things that does not have a linear answer. And, and also what does it, what does it, uh, uh, how does that affect us? Mm. Uh, because we are living in a world, I think, that are um, valuing linear thinking and also very like hard value. And whereas maybe I am very interested in the soft tissues of the world and also the soft thinkings and other ways of grieving, caring, uh, becoming, um, yeah, we will get back to that. But when, when you're speaking about the uh, softness, uh, and that, that makes me think about um, materials, and I have a, a question around materials for you. I um I was thinking that we could go back to um the the work uh, behind you, posthumous dialogue, and speak a little bit about um what we actually see here and uh, the choice of materials that you've done um, for example you have the replicas of the bones and uh, you've used rubber and um, I, maybe you could talk a little bit about like what about the choice of materials and also about how um, how they are fastened I see that mm -hmm. like they are very like they're tied together they're linked together they're braided together and um, your thoughts around this is this like they, some of them are like fastened really uh, like hard or roughly like is that like some gesture of uh, uh, control or dominance or um, yeah your, your, your methods in working mm. with these materials can you speak a little bit about that yeah so uh, basically like I think that uh, for me again like it all comes back to what kind of point of reference we all have like I um I've always had a, um, uh, you know, I've never been really scared of death as such. So um, 
uh, what I've done here is, but, but again, like I have not used the actual bones for a reason because it, in a, in a way it has to do with, uh, I, I felt more free kind of approaching new ways of grieving or celebrating this find uh, by replicas. But what I've done is uh, uh, actually who, who is in the room, right? Like uh, we have a circle of, uh, of animals. We have the horse, we have the dog, we have the cow. We have the pig uh, and, and we have the cow. And then we have the remains of the female body that has given birth. That's, that's the knowledge that we do have from this find. So this is the components that are in the room. So we have the, the female hair and also the horse uh, hair. So, uh, and I've, I was uh, trying out ways of kind of constructing this and I ended up needing a flexible material, but also then I was thinking about this uh, game of domination uh, that has been slowly going on, you know, from we started domesticizing um, any, anybody else than ourselves actually. So this is the reins and the ways of trying to, to slowly, slowly make these animals work for us rather than um, uh, something else. Uh, this is obviously something that we have done. So I think I've, I've been uh, just uh, experimenting with that. And, um, and, uh, but I've been also trying to use, for example, the, the construction is uh, made of copper. This is something that obviously was also at the time, it's like the bronze, uh, the bronze age. And so like I've been, guided and informed by the actual find in, in what materials I've been using. But then the rubber, I guess there was just like a, maybe a bicy old bicycle uh, rubber um, thing in my studio. And then I, you know, I started and then I was like, yeah, exactly. This is what I need. I need something flexible because if not, it won't, uh, it won't, uh, it won't work. And, and then I am, um, um, yeah, I guess I was testing the tension of, of how to, to kind of uh, uh, connect these, these uh, components. How about the braiding? Uh, yeah, the, precisely. The choice of, uh, of, of, I've of... been braiding. I, it, I keep coming back to braiding because it's such a caring act though. Like uh, as, a, as grow, growing up, I was always braiding either a horse or an, a friend or something like that. Uh, something that or somebody you know the feeling of like um, my mother braiding me it's such a caring action so i think that it was just natural to start braiding also like when christina came into my studio uh, there was like heaps of braided hair on the floor so i i guess it's just a natural act for me so and now i also started braiding the the rubber which was very satisfying actually it was hard to stop very hard to stop I know that you said that you you, you come for a, from a place or um, for a, from a, a context where you live with life and death uh, um, all the time and like uh, leftovers from uh, the dead is something that you 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 care of uh, and it's not scary, right? It's like is that something you kind of translated into this then? Sorry. Um, well. The thing is, uh, uh, I often work from like personal, like not, not like with biography because I'm an artist. So like for me, um, it's more like uh, points of, of uh, departure for me. Like, so uh, I've been really interested in, in the context that my family comes from, which is uh, actually from a, a place, uh, the northernmost point that you can come in Norway. Uh, you know, it's 72.5 degrees north. And there is only there is only stone and ocean and and uh, I've been going back there. We will get back to that, but I've been going back there and and you know being in in this kind of a situation where the community is very informed by different knowledge traditions simultaneously. And I find that so interesting that uh, if I sit with my with my uh, you know, fam some family members and have, having a cup of coffee and somebody cut themselves in the finger and you can't reach, uh, you know, uh, the hospital, which is eight hours away. 
then there is always a, a, on the refrigerator, there's the number for the blood stopper. You can always call him or her. So like there is something about being, you know, there is very different contexts uh, around the globe and, and the context uh, of like other knowledge traditions should often are either or in, in our understanding. And I just want to come back to that. that so in, in this uh, place on the planet, like uh, this is what you play with. You, you build your huts with maybe old whale bones and some fish bones and, and then you find, you know, the, like this, it's not, um, it has different uh, meanings on different places on the planet. And I yeah. think we keep on forgetting mm -hmm. that. Mm. How about the, the, the structure or the, the form? I, I think I can say like the, the work borrows form from and elements from um, some ceremonial sites mm. uh, in, in different cultures, that yeah. is, uh, indigenous cultures. Uh, I mean, you have, as we spoke of now, like all the bones, there's like this kind of uh, dome structure or teepee mm -hmm. structure. There's like the flags, a uh, cross. Um, it's very, uh, it looks like a very ritual place some so of some sort. What, what are you, your thoughts about? Well, um, again, I think that it's a point of departure for me, um, uh, you know, coming from um, family history that, that comes from a place where, you know, uh, both uh, uh, reindeers, uh, Sami people are like obviously a, a, a part of, of, of that place. It is in Satmi, obviously, but also like uh, a family that, uh, that, that comes from other uh, indigenous communities. Uh, like, um, I, I really think that, uh, um, ha you know, being, having that in a family history Kind of makes it natural to come back to and be informed by uh, by that and i've been really interested in learning more i know so little about that part of my history so i've been really interested in in like going back and learning more talking to ancestors interviewing people uh, but for me like building a hut uh, is a very natural like it's like uh, my my kids do that all the time to build a, a shelter or a hut and so for me, I think that I've, uh, it's a celebrational um, structure uh, and the flags, like to raise a flag is a very, both like a very action of resistance, but it's also an action of, of celebration. So, uh, but it's also, it's a half, it's an open half shape so mm. it's obvious that you're invited to go in and stand there and so you, then you're surrounded by the creatures that that made you somehow uh, so or you know the the ones that have followed you through history so it's also almost like um, uh, armor or or like a, a body jewelry of sorts power dome a power dome <laughs> precis <laughs> So, and, and again, I think that this is also because it's so early in this research that I'm doing on this type of finds. I think that I was also creating something that was open for, that could be added to, you know, as almost like a stage or um, a site of, of, of investigation. And this is also what will happen because we will activate this place throughout the exhibition. And, and so this, yeah, I, I see this as the beginning of something. Uh, but uh, about the, um, I, coming from the northern part of Norway and the Satmi part of, of Scandinavia, I think that I keep on all the time coming back to the atrocities and the, the cruelties that are be, uh, ongoing uh, against like uh, other, other species, against landscape, against uh, my, the, the indigenous uh, groups. So, uh, I think it's important to invite different ref frames of reference into, into our, our very privileged, <laughs> like a little bubble here, uh, where I'm sitting right now. So, Signe, that's so, so interesting. And I agree that kind of colonial gaze and colonial ongoing um, kind of project of um, killing uh, many different kinds of species and as you say landscape being part of that I think is is um 
is such an atrocious kind of situation that I think it's so wonderful you bring this sense of care and responsibility and ways of thinking about these things differently into your work. Um, I'm going to suggest because of time I suggest we maybe jump ahead and while we're talking about your kind of lived and personal experiences um, I suggest that we talk about your beautiful work Puppy Play um, mm -hmm. and just kind of it would be wonderful to hear about how your lived experiences and this background you've been talking about living in the north and south mainland um, could you tell us a little bit about how this work because that's the other work that's on show mm -hmm. uh, in the experimental field could you tell us about that work? Uh, uh, exactly. Uh, so um, the again, like I just must say that it's this is a very sensitive issue because, like my my in my family, there is uh, different kind of um, backgrounds that kind of come together. Yes, so I'm I'm the kind of bastard type, so to speak, uh, uh, which is uh, an interesting position to be in because then you have like one foot in in different mm -hmm. <laughs> like where did in my family history there's different strains that come together so to speak uh, but uh, yes uh, about um, uh, puppy play i mean it is this is a video work that came about also from very informed by my own bodily experience and and my own history of becoming a mother to a child that i hadn't given birth to uh, it was uh, very like um, uh, obviously a very like a huge experience to from one day to another suddenly I was in a hospital bed with an infant uh, uh, and becoming mother to her it was such a um, uh, yeah it, it taught me so much because what happened was uh, suddenly my, my <laughs> my body started lactating and and you know completely completely just becoming mother so quickly and I, it was such a shock to me how yeah how little biology has to do with anything actually because at the same time at home my dear dog uh, Sirran had been for her whole life preparing for motherhood she had been you know uh, treating socks as puppies and the cat is constantly her puppy and you know um, so she'd been like uh, preparing and preparing but when it was time to give birth to her puppies, they were stillborn. And so these two kind of uh, experiences just came together in, in, in uh, this work because I, I felt the need to kind of explore that further. And I did that by inviting my children and, and uh, our dear uh, neighbor children to actually seances of, of play where we were playing, uh, uh, yeah, puppies and, 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 and mothers. And so my dog, uh, and they wouldn't stop. They just went on and on uh, and then it became dark. And I, we just kept filming and filming and, and, um, and it, it was such a beautiful, uh, um, um, yeah, very beautiful seance of play actually that, that is. Uh... And it really just shows these kind of beautiful bonds beyond um, biology, as you say, in those two personal stories. Um, mm. And hopefully when you in the audience get to come to see this exhibition installed, you'll see that this work is kind of the work that greets you and um, kind of echoes throughout your entrance um, down into the um, underground spaces of Accelerator. So I think it's, it's a beautiful kind of um, allegory for how we can think about building other families. And yeah, because it's, again, it's about that, right? It's about a hybrid understanding of, of, of reality. And I think I keep on coming back to that also in like, uh, that, that we maybe, uh, it's time to invite more yeah like I, I really I feel um, I feel so grateful every time uh, I, I discover uh, like an, a question that is kind of um, breaking up this kind of uh, structured reality that that we have taught to to fit into and uh, and so for example this experience of becoming a uh, family uh, and also being family together with my dog uh, has informed this work a lot yes so in this work um it's a it's a short film for about like five minutes that um is presented at accelerator as 
um, actually the first uh, work that you will encounter uh, meet as a uh, when you enter the exhibition. Um, it, you will see uh, children and the stock dog interact in different ways and or actually like yeah playing family and mm -hmm. this is uh, um uh, like beyond like being very much like developed out from this uh traumatic experience that you just uh, um explained also um coming from your relationship with animals in mm -hmm. your upbringing precise because like it's um, uh so I have this family history of the like the northern northern Norway and obviously this di different knowledge traditions existing at the same time uh, but then we moved south so to speak which is to the northern Norway and uh, which is still very far north and uh, when I I was born uh, into a communal household which was very where the adults in that household was very uh, occupied with experimenting with breaking norms and and like uh, um uh, it was uh, in many ways also um, yeah, a difficult, uh, difficult background because I had this patriarchal father figure and then there was a lot of children and women and, and it was a lot of, um, yeah, um, um, sometimes uh, me as a child, I, it was a little bit like fending for myself uh, kind of situation and then but the beautiful part of that uh, was obviously the other bonds that was created simultaneously because I, I made these very close relationships. I, really, like they became my friends, my family, my witness. For example, uh, the most important one is Rauen, which is the horse that I, has followed me through uh, that part of my life and up to teenage time. Uh, but also like uh, I think that this becoming family or, or like friend with, with something that is not human is comes very much from that early part of my childhood in this commune because there was like maybe sometimes a lack of boundaries, uh, which can be a difficult thing for a child, but it could all it can also then uh, if that forms me lack of boundaries in this sense was also interesting because that meant that the, the, I could as yeah be a, a family with a cat for example hmm. and i know that you also talked a lot about them um, um I, I mean coming back to archives uh I, once when you describe yes. encountering archives and, and and kind of the uh i don't know like mm, grief or something you felt was also that you something you feel often is missing is the is the bodily experience that how, how that is often uh lack lack or like not there it, it's really difficult to like put mm. in archive maybe but uh it's also difficult to handle and but that's something that you're often occupied with and and, and uh, working with and trying to kind of um embrace or um yeah um focus on on the bodily interactions between species and and how mm. what knowledge um that grows from that right yeah that mm. is that's, that is true and i think that again they are there but it's just that we don't really talk about them because they are the often there is like glitches or like uh quest non-answered questions mm. in, in our archives and and that's why I, it's, um, it's, so, uh, it's such a, a joyful journey to kind of uh, have, to, to let my gaze kind of rest upon them. Uh, because uh, like, let's face it, like the whole kind of archiving act is be me being very interested uh, of rituals. I see the whole archiving act as like the biggest ritual of them all. What I see is like, we have this as a species we have this enormous need of collecting describing storing uh, and i so i feel that we have something like i feel i have something very much in common because i me too i'm interested in how can we make sense of it all how can we make sense of being human <laughs> like uh, and i think that archiving and and the whole natural sciences is is just also such a such a quest 
So you must remember that if, like, when when you do make a find uh, and you do archive it in the, for example, the archives of the historical museum, you actually sign a contract that says that it will be archived in for eternity. So I mean, this is a deeply ritual, <laughs> a deeply almost. Um, it's a, a deep, a very big commitment. Mm. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And and so yeah, I I maybe I maybe I see archives as also um, yeah the act that it actually is. You know mm. the the act that is carried out by us. That's something I'm interested in. I wanted to come back to the body <laughs> and. Um, ask you about your artistic methods uh, because I, I learn and now hear you speaking um, learning through and with your body is mm. central for you and uh, your bodily encounters seem to um, inform your practice in a, in a deep way and I know also that uh, now you talk about your collaboration with Kulbey I know that you invited some of the dancers you are collaborating with uh, to go down into a swamp with you. I, something that you you often do a rich like a ritual you often do. I know that you you've spent mo- months in north of Norway um, wolf watching. I I know that you learned to free dive uh, in in order to engage mm. with your subject and and um, put your body out there to learn uh, and to be out of your own environment. And could you talk a little bit about how, how, um, how do these embodied encounters fuel your practice? I think it's more, again, like a method of ownership for me, like it's a way of, um, so as an example, I can tell when I went back to Mehan, which is the, which is the village that my family, uh, my family history is from. Uh, one of the, an example of what I did was that uh, I heard, I interviewed my family and, and I heard this story about my great aunt who was a midwife and how she had been collecting uh, uh, whatever she could find of the bodies of the ocean and, and kind of caring for them. And I felt so extremely, uh, yeah, related, which obviously I am, uh, to her her and also her her acts and i heard this story about when she didn't really have place anymore <laughs> to store more she actually st- stored them in her garden and, and kind of uh, hid them away in the garden so when we went back we actually got uh, permission to dig up the garden of w- where she had lived you know in, in the 40s uh, and uh, and we found this we actually found seven vertebras of, of, a, of a sperm whale that had been, uh, yeah, dug down in the garden, and and for me, then that became I'm like, okay. So what is this? So this is, has been uh, the the you know uh, this has been a being swimming around in the, these vast oceans. So for me, the natural next step is obviously to make to 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 understand that. So then I started to try to learn how to free dive it's super hard and i started to talk to free divers and interview uh, free divers and also but uh, had to transform this this vertebra into a, a sort of um, a sort of uh, free diving tool because for me it became uh, uh, fruitful to see if i could uh, you know make it live again or like give it a new chance of of uh, of the function, so to speak. And so actually, this is a still from a video called Hicks und Draconis uh, that, uh, that came out of this uh, research that I did in a project that was uh, that ca- produced many works. But, um, and so this, actually I went back to uh, the Indian Ocean where these whales had migrated from to the northern tip of Norway because it's, it has a, like a very painful history of whaling uh, uh, but I wanted to go back to that spot and make it swim again, and then I had to swim. So then, so then, yeah, uh, I'm not. Uh, um, it's really hard, but it's interesting to see how one's body can actually learn to to 
to live and function in, in a very different element, then it makes me feel very close to, yeah, to, to water. And so, yeah, so for, for the last six, seven years, I've, I've been practicing also, because I have this love for the swamp, I've been practicing bog diving. So I've been free diving in, in a, a small bog that is very close to my house and trying to yeah, understand the inside of this, this very, very special place, which the swamp is. But this is not the bog, this is the Indian Ocean. <laughs> and it's clear that water is uh, also something that you come back to. Um, yeah. Mm. So I'll show you a short, uh, this is one of the stills from bog diving exercise. So this is actually uh, the inside of, of the swamp, very much like the swamp, for example, that the posthumous dialogue find was found in. Like I don't know what state of of uh, dying that lake is, which is something we will investigate obviously further. But this is my bog, by close to our house. I see a similar circular uh, movement or gesture as you um, you spoke about with the whale. You're you're kind of uh, taking the bones back to where. It, it came from i mean yeah. or you know the indian ocean and um it's like a, a, the circle it has like swum up like uh, up to norway and you're sort of take i mean you're taking the replica back but you're swimming with it again and it's similar with the posthumous dialogue you're uh returning to water mm. um with the uh, the dancers um and exploring um uh like watery environments mm. uh, um, uh, since this find was found in in water in in a bog actually this uh, just this is also such a, a work because this is uh, still from a work called thank you for caring that i also did at erland uh, at my friends and colleagues house at cultivator which is also about the bog because the thing is that there was a, a find in the in a small uh, water body near there where they had found horse bone and human bone together. And I found that so interesting. So what I did was actually to go back to the story about my friend, the horse, Rauen, when I grew up and grieving his passing uh, together with the horses there. So this film also ends by uh, actually us letting go of, of the remains of a horse into uh, this water body. So mm. it's like also reacting some kind of, um, yeah, goodbye. I think the other really interesting thing with the swamp or the bog water is that the purpose or one of the functions of a swampy area is kind of archiving and filtration. So the actual swamp itself is like a place of archive for all of the many, many creatures that kind of drift down and exist inside it. And um, you wrote a really beautiful letter to that swamp that you're working with um, that was published in OEE's um, wetlands issue, which I was really drawn to, which Christina also writes in as well. Um, but yeah, just to point out that like the, the swamp is also really an archive. Um, and I'm so, so happy you're bringing that up because obviously yeah. that's exactly what it is. It is, yeah. uh, but it's a, like a non-linear archive. It's a archive where like death and, and new life exists at the same time simultaneously. So it's like um, uh, it really has that capacity of, of kind of raising questions about w like what is what is time, what is eternity, what is <laughs> what is um, yeah. Uh, how can we understand time and, and like the sediments of, of a swamp is obviously but this you know like both it's a commodity that is like we have drained like 98 percent of all our swamps and and then we're super surprised that there is floods going on <laughs> and droughts uh, but but also like um, uh, it's also like the own the last the last pieces of actual um uh, non-economical sites like so it's interesting how the swamps can't be it can't be tamed because it like if you can't drain it so there is a few of them left and 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 yeah mm. i feel they have a lot to to add to the discussion <laughs> actually yeah they really really do absolutely yeah. they're very rich mm. how are we going for time 
So about uh, 10 minutes uh, left and I'm just uh, checking there's no uh, questions so far. Oh good, that means I get to ask my question. That's excellent <laughs> for me. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about um, just kind of, I mean, this has been so beautiful, Signa, but just kind of how exemplary your work is for me in, um, you know, trying to think about art and research and kind of, you know, this, when you're talking about this idea of the soft tissue, I think like part of um, our mission and kind of quest here at Accelerator is to really think through how can art and research or how, how does this, how do these meetings between art and research already exist? And in your work, I just find this kind of like beautiful energy and um, uncertainty that you were talking about. Um, and I just find them very intoxicating to kind of help me think about the possibilities of how, um, you know, how we can learn from art and how art can, can teach us in different ways without being, you know, just preachy or just one, one note, but by having a whole lot of different notes at the same time and kind of working in different harmonies. Um, so how do you kind of think about these, you know, very urgent questions of how we organize ourselves, how we live socially, religiously, poetically, how do you kind of think about, um, about that in terms of, yeah, your approach to art and research? Mm. Oh, that's a, that's a very difficult question. I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I, then we have to break it up a bit because like when it when it comes to first of all like art and research i think that we have to keep in mind that uh like um we are just we are just uh, all trying to make sense of like which we are we're looking for a way to to understand uh like uh, uh what it means to be the kind of of species that we are like um but, and we're doing that in different ways. Like um, I'm doing it in the way I'm doing it. But for example, when I meet somebody like, um, uh, yeah, Christina, for example, we actually we have that in common. Like it's not it's not like art or research. It's like we have that in common. We are on a common quest <laughs> of of like trying to like so, so it's like a, it's a um, common domain. How do you say that? Uh, um, domain or? yeah like it's we, it's like it's easy um to you know go into this exploration together because we actually both really want to know yeah so as long as we can have an open mind instead of like locking all the doors and think like okay i'm gonna like this is the right way and you are doing it the wrong way and you are you are not allowed to talk about that and is that true or is it false like do you have the right identity to talk about that i think it's really really important that we um find ways of being more inclusive uh in the field at large because we need more than ever to to find uh, new ways of uh, understanding cohabitation and coexistence because the ways that we have had uh, access to has led us here mm. uh, yeah <laughs> that's it like we need we need alternative ways of uh, of um, dealing with this because so you, now you and christina are are sort of like um engaged in in uh new uh explorations together one could say um I mean, she, she's leaving her office and you're leaving your studio and you're out doing field work together or you will. Yeah, that's, mm. um, that's actually all we want to do, but it's, <laughs> Corona has kind of gotten in the way. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think that, um, and also like, uh, there is many researchers that I've been in contact with throughout my, my different processes and also throughout Accelerator's uh, um, brilliant work with the kind of uh, you know creating meetings uh, bet between me and, and uh, uh, other researchers it's like it's just uh, I am like seriously curious not only of the like the the facts that they find on their way but about both like uh, what they do with the remnants that they see as non-fit or like not important I, I'm, I'm seriously curious uh, also about the behavior that 
like squirrels, you know, we're just uh, uh, working about and trying to, to understand it. And then, boom, it's over. Then life mm. is over. <laughs> and then what is left is, yeah, this, the, the archives of, mm. of, uh, of the knowledge that we're trying at the best of our ability to, to create. And people, for example, like Christina, obviously she, she comes with a different gaze upon like it's the opposite of like, you know, Marsh and Pope. I talked about that earlier in this presentation who they were rushing to claim this species and to say, yeah, I made this, I, I, I name this being like, but then suddenly comes, a, a, you know, a new time where a new type of gaze is really needed. And I think that's exciting to, to discover that mm. and yeah. <laughs> We have a very like a short minutes uh, left, uh, and uh, uh, Tinga, did you want to mention something about unicorns? <laughs> yes, please, <laughs> because uh, I just wanted to, you know, to share that with you all that, like uh, this posthumous dialogue kind of process, and the find at Hertogs Moss and kind of. Um, has catapulted me into this new, uh, beautiful, uh, and very exciting um, area, which is like the relationship between the, you know, the, the myth of the creation of the human uh, and uh, like how we tend to um, uh, have the need to, to write away, you know, the, the hybrids, so to speak. And so I've been looking at, for example, uh, yeah, the, the, the myth of the, the creation of the human, which is obviously um, our, in our culture, it's uh, the Christian myth of, of Jesus, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the belly of, of Virgin Mary. But when I, in my research, I've now found that uh, in the early scripts of the Bible, actually, uh, Mary had a lover, and that was a unicorn. Uh, and then came the Middle Ages and, and the, the unicorn was kind of, you know, uh, erased away from history. But since then, like the unicorn horn has been like for a long time been the most expensive material uh, there is in Europe and traded between the countries. And then obviously now we know that the unicorn horn is actually Norway tusks and uh, uh, the Danes uh, through super cruel and super colonial and problematic uh, <laughs> uh, trades with the with the Inuits, uh, yeah, stole them from them. And so, yeah, so I'm now looking at like archives of unicorn horn that there's hundreds of them in in Denmark, for example, and uh, looking into again this hard tissues and the remains that that we are have erased away, but what is actually there? Like why? Why can't, why can't Mary have a lover that is a unicorn instead of, you know, uh, being a virgin that gives birth to? Such a good question. <laughs> I've never thought of that question before, but it feels like one I've, I've needed to ask. Well, thank you, Signe. Thanks for sharing the, uh, also the, um, something that you uh, just started to uh, work upon a research. And um, I think that um, it's a, uh, uh, that that last thing you shared is a, a good end note and um yeah so thank you so much Signe and thank you everyone that has uh, been following us and listening to this presentation mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully um we can all uh, welcome you soon to accelerator and the experimental field and to Signe's two works that she's presenting mm. please please do come and especially mark in your diaries Wednesday the 5th of May which is going to be a really beautiful presentation with the four dancers from Cold Body Company and also um, Associate Professor Christina Fredengren who we've talked about so much tonight and the wonderful Signe Johannesson. So thank you everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye. Thanks Signe. Bye everyone. <laughs>